This district was organized in 1855. So going from 1855 to 1921, the district at that point had 122 years of being a place of education. If you back it up to 1849, when school first started as a district, uh, was started by a, a missionary and his wife out by Holy Family Church. And uh, if you include those years before it was actually uh, made an organized district, you've got 127 years worth of education, uh, valuable education. As we say in there, a lot of kids would not have had it for a multitude of reasons, uh, just like a lot of kids later never had the opportunity to go to high school because they couldn't stay in Little Falls and there was no bus transportation to get to town and go to school. This building sat for 31 years on the Brucher's property. As June says in there, they had kids had a lot of fun in it and so on. We wanted to, to be moved here earlier than what it was, but it was a time when the fair board was just starting out on this fairgrounds, and they were leaving older buildings, and they didn't want to drag a new, an old building onto the new fairgrounds, plus they didn't really have any money to do it with. They were starting out from scratch with buildings. There was nothing here. So our efforts to try and talk them into moving it just kind of fell by the wayside. But then there are probably several of you who know Mike Wilson, who was an um, artificial inseminator, was acquainted with the Bruchers, knew the school was there, was sure that they would let it go, and started working on trying to convince the fair board that they needed to move that school here. Mike went off of the fair board, and a gentleman by the name of Dennis Nelson. A lot of you maybe had Norma Nelson as a teacher in high school, if you went to Little Falls High School, and Dennis was Norma's brother. He went through country school, District 35, out by Randall, felt he got a very good education, went on to be a college teacher, eventually a professor and a dean of the University of Minnesota at Duluth. And when he came on the fair board and realized that Mike had already set the groundwork trying to get it moved here, he took over and proceeded to convince people that this school needed to be moved to, to the fairgrounds. And uh, he kind of turned June and I loose when it come to doing whatever we saw that needed to be done. In fact, he told the fair board members, stay out of the way of those two women or you're gonna get run over. Don't, don't, don't bother them, just let them go. And so he, uh, he was very much behind us, uh, stood for everything and anything we wanted to try and accomplish here. But all of this work that has been done on here, as is and said in the movie, has been done by volunteer work, uh, volunteer dollars, donated dollars. We did do some fundraising. Uh, over the years, but there were still a lot of dollars that came in as memorials to family members that passed away and so on that have brought the school back to what it would have been as an operating school. Needless to say, time and, and uh, age, the lead paint had to go. We needed to do a lot of work inside because of the condition of it and all of the lead paint. Um, the boys that you saw working on the school on the outside were two young men that had gone to school here. And they were working in the school the first year. And uh, in their off time, shall we say, when there wasn't somebody in the school, um, they were talking, well, we could do this. 
we could do that. We can fix this. And they did. They spent a lot of time and energy to get this school up and running. And uh, so has everyone else. All of the books, everything that is in here otherwise has been donated. Uh, we treasure what we've been given. We hope we don't lose anything. We hope we don't have anything damaged. Our last prized possession is this globe. We looked for a long, long time for a globe of that sort. Um, you couldn't even find them on the internet, and if you did find one or two, we couldn't afford it anyway, so it didn't make much difference. The gentleman that donated that about two years ago, um, Eldon LeBlanc, bought it at his school's auction for $2. He'd had it in his living room for many years, and he said, finally his wife said, you know, uh, haven't we looked at it long enough? <laughs> Can't we put it away? And so he said it went upstairs in a closet in the back corner where it wasn't going to get damaged, but he had finally come to the conclusion that it was never going to mean to his family what it had meant to him, and he felt this was a good place to put it. And so he came down, he put on all the new rigging, and uh, the kids are very intrigued. And it hangs that high because they are too intrigued. They want to just spin it. They want to play. <laughs> yep. So um, we appreciate everything that we have in here. There is a lot more in the museum, which when the school was operating as a school, that attachment, or its predecessor attachment, was the woodshed and pony uh, area. When I started in here in 1941, there was still a manger with old musty hay in it and a tie rack out about where the pump was and uh, where ponies would be tied while school was. Or in the wintertime, they had housing for cold weather and so on. Some of the teachers told how they were aware that some of their predecessors, some of their early family, the teachers had ridden horse to school. And so it was necessary to have something where the animals could be weathered and so on, out of the weather. Uh, there is so much to tell about rural school history. But one of the things I just want everyone to know, to think about the value that rural schools played in this nation. Uh, this one, when you think of it having, in this building alone, 96 consecutive years, think how many children went in and out these doors on an annual basis. You multiply any sort of an amount by 87 counties, and it becomes thousands in one year that traveled through the doors of a rural school in Minnesota. Not only Minnesota, but every state in the nation had rural schools. And a lot of those people would never have had the opportunity to get an education if it hadn't been for the rural school to begin with and for the men and women who were willing to work for peanuts, and I mean peanuts. If you look at some of the records, financial records, uh, it's in the 26 or 32 right in that era where the teacher was earning $50 a month. Out of that, she was paying room and board to somebody, or as one teacher um, from out in the Hillman area told us one year that she was expected in the home she stayed in that she'd go out and help with the chores in the evening. So that was part of her room and board. Uh, because, uh, and then she still had schoolwork to do when she got in because they did all of their, their preparation, all of their checking of papers and stuff was done after school hours. With eight grades, 
you don't have a lot of spare time throughout that day to be spending on work preparation. So I, I really admire anyone who gave up a lot of their life to be a country school teacher. They earned a lot more credit than they've ever been given. And I hope that some of, sometimes some of them are given credit in some way, made to realize that other people do know what they had to go through, do appreciate it. Um, this school, as I say, has had everything donated. The old Mary Ground that's out here came from the Little Rock School. It goes back to the 1800s. We have a picture of that Mary Ground. It was the Simon family that donated it to the fairgrounds. We have a picture of Frank Simon on there as a youngster at about the age of 10. And uh, he's been gone for many, many years. Uh, so it, uh, it has seen a lot of kids playing on it. Um, our little old outhouse came from Dick Thielander. No, it's not quite the outhouse that we had at country school because they all had a privacy fence on them, or at least all that I know of did. Uh, this one doesn't, of course. It was somewhere in Dick's backyard, I think, right? Yeah. But it is at least a sample of the kinds of utilities that we had. Um, we carried in the water. We carried in the wood. We all had chores to do, which, in my estimation, helped build res responsibility in a way that it isn't taught in today's world, expected by the parents or the school system. It built an early responsibility in the children to be of help and to take care of doing what they needed to do without being told. It was just one of those things, a way of life. I can't say enough for rural education. I just hope that more people, as they see what a rural school really was, can begin to appreciate what it was to have these little buildings scattered all throughout Minnesota, no more than five miles apart because no child could have to walk more than five miles. By the way, grandmas and grandpas say uphill and downhill, but um, it, uh, that's just a, a fallacy. It makes it sound even harder than it was. But uh, we had all had our shortcuts. We had our ways. Uh, when my three little rug rat brothers came along, they were so small compared, I'm 10 years older than they are, by the way. Uh, they got a ride to school because my dad bought an old cutter, put a little house on it, and my mom took us to school in the morning after my dad had harnessed the horse before he went to work because she was too short to throw the harness up. <laughs> but uh, she would take us to school when it was really 40 below and it was sometimes, she warmed rocks or brick, uh, usually a rock, in the oven of the wood stove, put it in there, and we had that to put our feet against in order to keep your feet, because even though it was only a mile, we didn't have the kind of clothing you have today, the protection. Uh, times were different, very different. But they were good times. I wouldn't trade them. I would not trade my my education in a rural school. Uh, rural schools were more than education. They were also a social ability for rural kids because normally the farmsteads were far enough apart and the kids had enough to do at home. You did not go running to the neighbors like kids do today. And so you went to school uh, for the fun of it, of socializing, as well as the work of getting an education. It, um, it was a two-way street. It also kind of helped on discipline. When you're going through a one through eight grade school, 
you've got all of your brothers and sisters, or several of them, going to school at the same time you are. You also probably had an aunt and uncle, cousins. But if the teacher had to give you a lecture on something, you knew very well the rest of your family was going to be the first one in the door to tell mom and dad, teacher had to get after so-and-so. And mom and dad took it from there. <laughs> and you wished you had behaved. Never, they talk about people wearing dunce hats, standing in the corner. In all of my years here, I never saw anyone uh, standing in a corner. I never saw one being verbally abused. If teacher had to talk to you, you stayed in at recess and you had a quiet conversation with her. It was not something that she tried to make you embarrassed by and so on. But just because of the fact that people talk about dunce hats, um, one year when we had someone in here as the teacher during fair time, she made a dunce hat. And it's amazing how many kids wanted that dunce hat and go stand in that corner. In fact, one of the bulletin boards here has a picture of that young man standing in the corner. We have been without a one-room school in Minnesota, or thought we were, since 1971. A few years ago, I became aware that there was one remaining one-room school in Minnesota and it's up at Angle, Northwest Angle Inlet. Uh, it is part of the War Road School District, but if the kids were to go to War Road, when they did close the school for a short time, uh, they had 40 miles by water to get to school, or 65 miles going up into Canada and back down into Minnesota uh, to go to War Road. It was closed for a very short time before that community, which when we were up there three years ago now, numbered 70 for census. They practically, every soul in the town, went to St. Paul, talked to the governor, to their senator representative, and said, you have to come up here and see what our children have to go through to go to school. And by gosh, they talked them into coming. They came up there. They saw the school records. They saw the grades of these kids, heard how many kids from that school had become a graduating salutatorian or valedictorian of a war ward high school. And it wound up, the governor said, this school gets reopened and it will never close. Now, I don't know how long he can guarantee that, but this is quite a few years ago already, and um, it's still open and running. The teacher that was teaching there originally had been there for many years, was retiring. The lady that's there now as the teacher uh, was disappointed she was teaching for the War Ward School District in the elementary third grade, and she was ready to leave the school, leave teaching. And the um, superintendent said, you know, would you consider going up to Northwest Angle? I think you'd like it there. We don't want to lose you as a teacher. And so she said, well, after thinking about it, she would go one year. She'd give it one year and see what happened. She told us she hadn't been there six months, and she says, I had made up my mind I was never going to leave there. And when we were up there, she had been there 25 years. At that point, she's still there. She lives on an island five miles from the mainland, goes by boat in nice weather, by snowmobile in bad weather, and said how many times she stayed overnight in the school along with two children of hers that came back and forth to school with her. Um, they would stay overnight in the school because of a bad storm and they didn't want a chance getting lost in it, trying to get home. Foggy times when 
She had two children going, and she said they'd sit on opposite ends with one arm out so that they could feel for the rice fields because if they would get into the rice, get it tangled in the motor, they'd be sunk. And so they had a lot of ordeals to deal with just in going back and forth by their own choice, but they chose to do that. Um, I'm, I don't know if she's still teaching, but she was there two years ago yet, that I know. And I, I don't think she'll leave there unless it's something that she, um, because of ill health or something, has to until it's retirement time. Was uh, If you have a chance, take a look, because they were in, <laughs> in Dick Thielander's log structure for a school. Um, and she said it was so cold in there that the kids would sit with blankets wrapped around them to keep warm. It, it, the wind was just going right through the building. Then they built this uh, long one-room rambler type schoolhouse, electric heat, um, very technical. There were only five or six kids, I think it was six, there that year that we were up there. We got a lot of video of it. Uh, we have a gentleman that wants to do a documentary on rural school history. And when, he, when I told him there was that school, he says, is there any chance we could go? And so uh, another friend of mine and he drove up there and spent three days. And it, it was a fun blast because these kids, it, there was someone in the area that um, wanted to remain anonymous. But he gave, at the end of the school year, a crisp $100 bill to the student that the teacher had declared exemplified their motto, which was do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And um, it had to do, they had to be a good citizen, they had to do good work in school, so on and so forth. The year we were there, it was a little fourth grade girl that got the $100 bill. But they put, put on a program while we were there, and it was standing room only. There were people from 50, 60 miles away that came for that program. It was a standard end of the year program that they did every year. This little girl took her $100 bill, and she went out to the cloak area. They had little cubes for their books and so on. She laid her $100 bill there in plain sight and went off to have lunch and play with the rest of the kids and stuff. And the uh, photographer nudged somebody, and he said, say, she left her $100 bill there. Somebody's going to walk off with that. And the gentleman said, no. Not here. He said, that can lay there for two weeks and it'll still be there. He said, no one here locks the door. No one is afraid of being broken in. No, nothing is ever locked up around here. We've never had a problem. And he said, no one would ever touch her money. It'll be there. It's okay. You try laying a $100 bill and turning your back on her. <laughs> Normally. Uh, but... Um, it was a wonderful experience, and it goes to show what kind of power people really have if they make up their mind that they need to, that they can bring about a positive change. And it certainly was a positive change to reopen that school. So, with that, we want to hear uh, some of your either questions, your stories about rural school. How many of you actually attended a rural school? Well, half of us, better than half. Uh, in this area for the most part or elsewhere? Everybody pretty much around? Uh, I think in the Cushing area. Yeah, but. And out here. Yeah, yeah, but not in yeah, another, in in not another state or. Yeah, yeah. okay. In Morrison County. Morrison County. Wisconsin. Wisconsin? But 
Now, was your rural school very similar to this? Because my saying is a rural school is a rural school is a rural school. Yes, and I went as a guest of my girlfriend. The teacher allowed me to come for a couple, two or three days with her. So that's my only experience. But it, it almost felt smaller than this. But it had, I think, all eight grades. I think I was in yeah. sixth or seventh grade when I went with her. Mm -hmm. I thought that was the best, best experience I've ever had. Because mm -hmm. I was in a public school, not in Minnesota. Uh, yeah, I left Little Falls School System when we moved out in the country. So it was a real change for me because I had started in the old Washington School in Little Falls. Yeah. Uh, uh, so to have all eight grades, and I recall when I first started school, uh, there were uh, three cousins in my grade, two girl, a boy and a girl from one family, and a girl from another family. The two girls came to school with black socks, long socks. My mother sent me to school with white socks. I was a city kid. And I remember looking at them in their black socks and thinking, why in the world would they wear black socks? And I'm sure they were thinking, who does she think she is? She wears white socks, you know? What's wrong with them? Well, it didn't take very long, and I was wearing tan socks because my mother was washing clothes on a washboard after having left an electric washing machine behind in town. We didn't have electricity in the country. So uh, you looked for shortcuts, and you really didn't want to be trying to keep white socks white on a washboard. So uh, there were a lot of experiences that came about as being a country school. We'd like to hear some of your stories. Um, on, uh, first of all, I'm representing the Morrison County Genealogy Society, and we are a group of people who are interested in you learning about and preserving your family history. We promote research uh, tools on the internet and through programs. Pat Quinn over here, if you want to talk with her, she knows all about research. But we also want you to uh, promote your own family stories. And for example, next month on September 25th, Monday night, 6 o'clock, we have a guest who is specializing in photography, old photos, identifying them, helping you care for them, helping you duplicate them. Can you add to that, Pat? Did you say organize them? Organize them. Both, both physically and if you do the computer. We, we will touch on both. And, and so uh, if you want to learn more about us, we have brochures available. Please take them and uh, study up on that. Um, when we designed this program tonight, we wanted to talk, uh, have, Dorothy was our main speaker, and we are so glad to have June and Dorothy together here tonight because they work so hard on this schoolhouse along with some other help, as you have just heard. And now uh, we have several other things in the lineup. That map over there is got all the places of the schoolhouses in Morrison County. And there were a group of people who worked to identify those places. And Pete Larson is the head of that group. So he's going to fill us in on that next, but just a moment. Um, I have a special guest back here sitting there in coveralls, Jean Luxterkamp, who turns around and looks behind him. Jean Luxterkamp is from the, between Sox Center and El Rosa. And in his neighborhood, there is, was an old ghost town called Unity, Minnesota. One time it was, hope, it was hopeful and it had businesses. Last building standing is an old schoolhouse. Gene and his 
group of friends have spearheaded the effort of restoring it. I got to see it this spring. They are making this in mint condition. They were working on it. We couldn't go in, but we took pictures through the window. He has a promotion way that is pretty interesting. He's going to speak. And also, uh, my dad, Dick Thielander, who donated the outhouse, He's going to uh, speak about an old photo he donated to this schoolhouse. And if I can get my father-in-law up here, Andy Sterica will uh, talk about a game at recess. It had to do with the Prohibition era. And so, and then as we go on, I want to break out into your story. But we're going to, the next person on the list is the four that went through the work of setting up the, identifying the locations. Pete, you want to come forward and bring your group with you if you want to? They don't want to. They don't want to. Yeah, please stand over there, Noki and Pat and Dick. Give them a big round of... <laughs> anyway, we're going to do this just a little bit differently. It is the fall of 1947. I am the teacher. There are certain ground rules. My name is Mr. Larson. That's my assistant. Mrs. Larson over there, and the last half teachers will be Mr. and Mrs. Tedford. A few of the ground rules. There's no whispering or talking. There's no gum chewing. Those offenses will result in standing in the corner, contrary to what you say. Where I grew up, we stood in the corner. Now, you notice I said we. Uh, there is no interrupting the teacher. And last but not least, there is no cell phones. <laughs> that, will, that will result in a trip to the woodshed where you will meet the Board of Education. <laughs> is there an ear wheeling? My dad used to do that when he was 12. Well, I don't know. <laughs> the first grade teacher I had, I saw her lay a couple seventh and eighth grade boys across her desk. And I don't think there was any air in between. And do you know what the message was for the rest of us? What do you think? Plain and simple. She only had to do it once. Everybody understood. Anyhow, we don't remember the exact year, but it was June Brucher that cornered Pat Tedford, and how she, Pat Tedford, convinced her husband, Dick, and how they convinced me and my wife to go research this, we don't know. <laughs> but we did. And it was actually kind of fun. Uh, the, uh, actually, to find where all the districts were located wasn't that difficult. You look in the old plat books. All schoolhouses were identified in old plat books by either a schoolhouse symbol or some such thing, as were town halls. Many churches and cemeteries were marked that same way. So that part was pretty easy. The tough part was finding when the districts were formed. Uh, I don't have that piece of paper you do there. Uh, but the last group that was formed was in 1915, and there was a group of about seven schools that were formed in 1915. Now, it lists 151 numbers were issued to Morrison County, but not all 151 were in service at one time. Some of the earlier schools had closed due to population movement. Uh, the families grew up, they moved out of the area, the old folks stayed behind, no room for new folks to move in, so no reason for a school. Some schools burned and were replaced, 
and they were probably moved a mile to a mile and a half from the original location because, again, of population changes. Uh, some schools we found as early as 1919, where there was no more taxes being leveled, levied for those districts. Final distribution of school funds made in 1920 and nothing after that. So we can assume that some districts were gone by 1920 already. Uh, school I went to, I believe, closed in 75, 76. I went to District 121, uh, which is two and a quarter miles north of Freedom. We have somebody whispering way in back. That's fine. Anyhow, uh, as long as I'm up here, I'm going to tell you just one little story about the school I went to. Like I said, the first teacher I had was, she was stern. But my, 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 did we learn a lot. How many of you know what a long A is? How many of you know what a short A is? Come on, people. Well, did you go to school? That's right. We learned that in first grade. That's good. That's good. We didn't have kindergarten. <laughs> How many of you can multiply and divide yet? Quite a few of you. Without a calculator? <laughs> in your head? Because you were showing flashcards. But anyway, the story I was going to tell you, as I got older, and come fall of the year, our school had a well, a dug well. And uh, so you'd take the cover off, and the school board would go to town, rent a big pump, pump it out, and then somebody would go down in there and scape, uh, scrape up the snake skeletons and the salamander skeletons. Throw some Hilux around, let it fill up, pump it out again, you were good to go. And that's the truth. And we drank. We didn't have a fancy thing like that. We drank out of a pail and a dipper. There was no toilet paper in the house house. Just like at home, Sears Roebuck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyway, my assistant over here, she went to District 189, or District 89, one mile west of Freedom. And she went to one of those rich schools. It was two rooms. Oh, okay. <laughs> and a basement. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Anyway, believe it or not, I remember all my teachers. Mrs. Cora Hansen. I uh, forgot the second one, Mrs. Newberg, and then Lily Olson and Joyce Lorenzen. Some of you may know those last two names. Uh, I don't remember who she had. I had um, <coughs> Miss Schlichting. Miss Schlichting. Miss Winsenberg. Miss Winsenberg, Joan Winsenberg. Jane. Jane. Jane Winsenberg. Carol Strahl. And Mr. David Ferrick. Mr. David Ferrick. If any of you know the Ferrick family of the 17, 18 kids who lived out by camp. Mm -hmm. uh, David Ferrick went to this school. Jane Winsenberg married... Uh, yeah. Plant. 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 Yep. And as far as I know, she's still alive. Yep, yep. she's still alive. Yep. So, anyway... I'm going to turn this program over to the other two teachers now. I did forget one important thing. Maybe Pat will do that. Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, everybody, let's stand and let's have a Pledge of Allegiance. Am I okay? Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Say, so, Pete, I thought you were going to talk about the flag a little bit. Oh, okay. Okay, I, I also went to a country school, and I'm just going to tell you a little story about my country school. I went to District 108 Country School, which was located between County Road 48, which is now 233rd Street, and County Road 49, which is now 263rd Street. And the school was about halfway between those two roads on 185th Avenue. Byron Schilling's land was next to the school. The school was on the west side of 185th Avenue and I had one and a half miles to walk to and from school. District 108 opened in 1902 and it closed in the spring of 1950 when the school year ended. I was born on January 11th, so I had to wait an extra year to start school as the cutoff date was December 31st. There were twins, the Poissons, who were in second grade when I was in first grade and they were not quite a month older than I was and their birthday was in December. I was in first grade the school year of 1947 and 48. Miss Ramona Seelan, who married Dale Cyrus in 1948, was my teacher. I have her obituary here and she graduated from high school in 1946 and went to one year of teacher training and then taught for one year in a country school and that was the year I was in first grade. She then just, just did substitute teaching, her obituary says, after that. She gave me all the first and second grade materials to learn, as I was the only student in first grade. And then the next year, the Poisson twins and I were all in third grade. The teacher we had after Miss Seelan was Mrs. Eva Gruing. I went to District 108 for my first and second grade combined year, my third grade, and my fourth grade. And then the school closed, and I went to Hawthorne School in Little Falls for fifth grade. It sure was different being in a town school with running water, bathrooms, etc., when we had none of that in the country school. Also, there was only eight students in our country school, and then I had a whole classroom of classmates. Hawthorne School closed after my fifth grade, and in sixth grade, Limburg School had just opened, so I was a student there. I always enjoyed my school years. Thank you. We were uh, living down in the Twin Cities area, and so I started school during first grade, 1944. And I went down there for a year and a half, and my dad was working for a defense company. Well, the war was over, that closed, so back to the farm we go. I go to one of these. So I went to the electric lights, the bathroom, the whole nine yards to walking out into, you know, behind a schoolhouse. And so it was a little different. It was kind of a shock for a while, but we got over it. And then I went there till, uh, through the sixth grade. Then they closed the school in 1949, and they sent me, to, sent all of us to Pillager. So I went a long ride, 18 miles to Pillager. Went to Pillager for two years, and then, huh? Where was your country? District 43. It was two miles, it's actually in camp, two miles west of the ferry. How many remember the ferry? Fort Ripley Ferry. It was two miles straight, exactly straight, straight west of the ferry. And uh, I, we moved to Freedom Area, and I graduated out of Little Falls High School. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions about them, but for them? Okay. I, I have a question. I'm curious about attendance during harvest time, especially with the boys, I guess. Was attendance during harvest time good? That, <clears throat> that totally depended upon the family. Some families put education first, and they worked around it. Others figured harvest was first and some kids were not in school. But the majority of the kids, from what I remember, of course, the area we grew in, grew up in, was very small farms. Uh, so harvest was not a big process. 
So you thrashed six acres of oats. <laughs> you picked a half acre of potatoes for yourself. Uh, you chopped some silage. You maybe picked six rows of corn that were left. That was it. The rest was all done during the summertime. Uh, the school I went to, no, harvest was not a big issue. Now, my mother talked about when she was going to school, potatoes were a cash crop at that time. There were potato warehouses at Topeka, Bell Prairie, uh, Gregory, Little Falls, uh, Fort Ripley. Uh, and that time period, they were allowed out of school. My mother come from a family of all girls, so all, all the, the older girls that were old enough to go pick potatoes were allowed to be out of school, provided they make up their schoolwork. Just because you weren't in school didn't mean that you were excused from not doing schoolwork. So, any other questions? D has a question. It, was that school on the other side of the river? Yeah, on the west side. Okay. Yeah. okay. But straight west of Fort Richards. One thing I forgot to mention when I uh, was going to school in uh, down in the Twin Cities area, there was probably 20 in the class. And I would have guessed I figured to probably the middle. Well, when we got up here and I went to 43, I became the smartest one in my class. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one. <laughs> yeah. Who were some of your teachers at Hawthorne? I had Miss Rickmeyer for Hawthorne. Oh, okay. And I had Mrs. Okay. Faltmore in sixth grade. Okay. I guess I have a question. How long did you guys work on getting and finding all those schools? Was it a long, long process, or was it short and sweet? We got yeah. together a few times. Yeah, it was four times at the probably. courthouse and, yeah. Yeah. and the museum. It wasn't all. It was spread out over. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe a year altogether. A year. Yeah. Probably all together. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> As, if there's any more questions for them, for if not, we're going to move on to the last building standing in Unity, Minnesota, Jean Lexter Camp. Gene, I know Gene because he's on the, uh, the giraffe horse. He is, oh, he's got beautiful horses and lots of horse equipment and buildings full of wonderful machinery if you're, if you're into equipment. He's the man to talk to. But Gene, why don't you come on up here, bring your book with you so that you don't forget it and uh, tell us about the project in your neighborhood. The cap won't fit anymore now. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello everybody. Hello. You probably Hi. were wondering when we walked in, who the hell are they? <laughs> <laughs> That's Ken Dahl. He's working on the project with us. He's right next to the school that we're restoring. And he lives on the farm that all this, all the buildings, businesses bought from this farmer and then went back to the farmer when the town just dried up, disappeared. So Kenny is right on that farm that owned all the land and property where the town of Unity was. But anyway, our project started there's a family of 13 that lived about a half mile from the school, and my dad bought that farm in 1948. So uh, I, kn I knew some of, the, some of the family, but not the youngest, which was the only one alive today, the youngest of 13. And in 2008, he was out by the cemetery where the church was used to be. And I never knew him, but then I got to meet him there, and he talked about the school, and I said, well, the township, you know, they don't know if they're going to keep it or what's going to happen to the school. Because the township had bought it in, in 1960, and the school closed in 49. So anyway, he said that school should be preserved. That was, that was, he was the instigator in this. And this fellow lives in Wisconsin, five hours away. And he's 80, whatever he is, 88 now or something. 
But anyway, this should be preserved. That was in 2008. So then in 2013, I believe, it was in the local Sox Center paper, the school was for sale to be torn down or moved. That was Getty Town Hall. So I called up this Roger Good pastor in Wisconsin, and that's, that's what was happening. Oh, that's got to be saved and preserved. So we went to the meeting. Steve Mittnorv owns land right next to it. So we went to the meeting. There was no bids. So we talked to him, and we got it bought, and we formed a foundation that, you know, that people are involved in a nonprofit foundation. So that's where it all started. And, well, in 13, in the winter of 13, Kenny Dole there, being on the original farm site, got all the abstracts and stuff, made copies so we could figure out where all these businesses were located in that town. So we got out, that first winter was all of that type of stuff. So then the next year, we did the roof on the school. You know, we did the shingling, wood shingles, just like it was, tore everything else off, put on wood shingles back. And the second year was the outside, was the windows and the sills, and that was all rotten. Half the windows had to be replaced. They were either broken with vandalism or something. And then the siding, the bad stuff. So the whole outside got fixed and painted. And then the following year, we did the inside, the plaster and tore the electric out of it because there was no electric. So he got it back to the way it was. He patched up all the plaster with the help of all the foundation members. And Kenny Dole being right there, he got involved with it probably more than he wanted to. I was like, Kenny, you want to come and help? <laughs> so, and then the following year, which was last winter, then we did the furnishings, the blackboards, it was all stripped, it was all gutted. So there was nothing that was familiar to the school. So we had to get everything back in, blackboards and pictures and water cooler and everything that was in there when the school was going. So that we did this last winter. So now we got it pretty well back to the way it was, other than we got stove pipes left to put on the stove. The original stove, the one we found, was out of an original country school, just like the one that was in that school. And uh, so we put that back in, and then the stove pipes have to be done yet, but it's pretty much to the point now where it's pretty much furnished the way it was, and due to the people that are still alive, especially to get Roger Goodpaster in Wisconsin, he worked for a lumberyard and was a draftsman and all that, he knew pretty much how everything was in this school. So he drew out floor plans and he knew how everything was, where the globe sat, where the, where the flag stood, and all this. So it's pretty well the way it was. Even the original outhouse was rotted away, the bottom two feet, the roof was rotted. We restored that, Kenny and a couple other people and myself, and restored that to back with the guidance from like Roger Goodpaster and a couple of others that went to school there. And that also had a private fence, like you were mentioning, privacy fence. So uh, that's been restored and it's sitting where it was originally. So now, and then the town, you know, whatever we could find out on the businesses, we put a monument out front. And that monument it's all laid out or the businesses that we could find that had bought in property. And we got that all laid out according to, you know, where it was. And then the ones we, they never bought property and they must have rented it or whatever. So there was no record of where they were. They were in that town, but, you know, we didn't have a location. So uh, they're just question marks, but whatever we knew, that's all plotted out and on that sign where these businesses were. And then on the other side of the monument is the history of the school. You know, how many children and all that type of thing. So it's kind of interesting for people to stop. And a lot of people stop. Being Kenny is right next to the school. 
they stop and they stop in his yard and he goes over to the school with him and you know and they got questions so he explains everything to him and the town it started in 1895 when the school was built and in 1907 the railroad changed its route it was supposed to come right down through the town so when the railroad changed its route the town dried up a couple more towns to the south of Unity, three and a half miles south, were started and formed, and there's three towns that dried up because of that. So it was a really a short-lived town. Like in 1913, it was pretty much done, and it started in 1895. So then the church was a half mile to the south of the town of Unity, and that started in... 89 there, it was started in 81 in a different location. And then in 25, they built a new church. And in 1964, the congregation ceased. They closed her up and they went to Sox Center in a different town, Grove Lake. So then in 68, the church was torn down. It was a beautiful church, nothing wrong with it, you know, because it was only built in 25. But it was the farmer tore it down and built a pole barn out of the heavy, heavy materials. So that's just a picture now left of that church. The cemetery is there. That's kept up. People still get buried there and that type of thing. So anywhere, anyway, I guess more than that, I don't know what to say other than... Could you talk a little bit about... I found your fundraiser very interesting, so if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, there's a guy by the name of Roger Way. His mother went to school there. And he likes researching history of everything. So he put together a book of everything he could find. The town, basically, Kenny and I found all the abstracts, and we found history on the businesses and all that. And then it goes to the families in that area. That's where he has been doing a lot of research on families and and why the railroad didn't go through Unity, why it took the southern route, and all of that. That's all in the book that he put together. So he three books already he did. This is the third one from this year. Of everything about the teachers and the people that went there and whatever he can dig up. And he, he sells them for $25, and that's donated to the foundation. He don't keep it, but it's $25 he gets for a buck. And they, how many booklets do you typically sell? Is it quite a number? Or? Well, at first it was more. You know, they got sent out to what do you call it, kids and grandkids of the people that went to school there. They, they wanted the history. And uh, this year, not yet. They just come out now. Not as many. They're still sending them out. And that. But it's like everything else. The kids and grandkids that are interested in history like that, they want it. And of course, a lot of them, they don't care. Like when I was a teenager, I, all I did was chase women. <laughs> and then you, got, you found a good one, and then you got married, and then you had to make a living. So that's all you thought about was making a living. Then it gets to be, you know, you're married about 30, 40, 50 years, and this really becomes important, saving the past. It really becomes real important. The bad thing is a lot of them died and passed away. You, you can't find that information anymore. That's, that's the worst. What was the population unity at its peak? I guess we never found that out. There weren't very many. There was, if they lived there, it was like over the creamery, over the store. And uh, the school teachers all lived on farms. You know, they were, there was no place for them to live there. And they were all pretty much young girls that were just, you know, out of school and stuff. And they would be living on a farm and probably did the same thing that you were talking about. They had to do some chores for their room and board, that type of thing. And, but otherwise, the population was basically just the businesses. Right, Kenny? Mm -hmm. Just there no homes in the town. Not that we know there of. There no homes in that town. Oh, no. It was strictly a business center, maybe you call it, for a little community. See, the whole... 
the Trashing Association, they had a shed there for the trash machine, and that was a co-op. And you go around to the farmers and they stack trash, I guess? So you go around and trash everybody. Yeah, and then there was a blacksmith shop, post office, a bar, a town hall, and ice house in the creamery, two stores, and a photo studio, and uh, the school, of course. So just the basics, what they needed in that town. Well, we know, you know, their names and stuff. Yeah, you but know the name, but I'm, where do you find that? Sure. The courthouse has nothing on this no, town. The, the historical society, of course, the county yeah, historical Yeah, anywhere society. that there would be the state census or the U.S. census. Some libraries have them. Uh, I think you could figure it out. We spent some time in St. Cloud, remember? Stearns, so Stearns County is where it's yeah. in. So oh, that historical society, yeah, so kind of a dead end, uh, very little. Yes. U.S. Census would only track where you live, not where you worked. Well, but it would list your occupation, and by that occupation, you could figure out, you know. Mm-hmm. Maybe the genealogy society can help you with that. Maybe we have to take that, see what we can find for you. Does anybody have any more questions for Jean Leistercamp? Well, do you have any more comments you want to say? Oh, it's very interesting. You're you're pretty long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very interesting, right, Kenny? Very interesting. I have this, I have something to tell you. Back there on that top of that toy box is a 1940 census of the entire state and your unity might be listed in there. Page um, 1940. 40. 1940. See, unity was pretty much done in ter- oh, 13. Okay. okay, I was. Oh, I, I'm sorry. See, then it probably. Here, I thought I had something else. Well, yeah, that'd be great. But uh, that was so short lived, and the courthouse has zero. The Stearns Historical Society, we found teachers' names that type of thing. Uh, a picture of the, what's the guy, the superintendent of schools, but a few things like that. But like in pictures of the school and that, they had a one picture of it when it was a town hall. That was it. The rest, like the school pictures that we did find were somebody's, you know, mother and dads went to school there and from Wisconsin or wherever, once in a while somebody would come up with something. So that's how we're finding st- stuff, but it isn't very easy because there isn't much around. The other thing we have in our school is shutters. The single shutters that were checked on the door. Which on the windows, yeah. Pardon? Shutters yeah. on the windows. Yeah, I, I meant on the windows, yeah. Which not all buildings have that, you know. When we noticed that in some of the earlier pictures that Gene said he found from some of the people. Gene has a book that he could probably pass around and is the picture on that? The school picture is on there. Not the I don't I don't know if the new one is on there that we restored. Could you pass that around so sure. people could look sure. at it? And and then if there's no more questions for Jane or no more comments from Jane, we'll have the next person on the agenda speak. I can get a couple more. I'll get a couple more than books. Thank you. I'll get a couple more. Uh, the next speaker is uh, the one who you stole the outhouse out back. You donated it. He's my father, Dick Thielander, and something else kind of special is that it's his birthday today. And so, yeah. And we were going to cut up his birthday cake after we take a picture of him with it. Um, and uh, so, the Dick Thielander, you have a Not much. photo. That's okay. Yeah, that photo is the log schoolhouse. Where is it? Right there. The, the one house, yes. Mm. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, my dad went to that school. My dad was born in 1897, and that picture was taken in 1900. But he did go to school there two years. And then they built a school just like this, just north of that one. And uh, his, I don't know, I think most of his family went. Because his older sister and two brothers are on that school. Yeah, that picture. picture. picture yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, where, where did the school stand? Huh? Where did it stand? That's cool. Just by the Twin Lakes Road, a half a mile oh, north oh, of where man. he turned down our place. Oh, man. And then we. Uh, where was this at? He all said that the, when they built a new school like this, the teacher and her brother they stayed in that school. The brother did janitor work and helped the teacher in the long school. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's yeah. Darling Township Darling. District 35. Yeah. yeah. And the names of all the kids are along the bottom. And this is was in the transcript in Yeah, one of the Swanson brothers found it years ago. My dad had lots of pictures made of it. But the photo is May 21st, 1900. And some of the boys on there are, in fact, most of them are barefooted. The girls seem to be wearing boots. So And I, I got a feeling that some of the younger girls' kids are probably sisters or something. Favorite. Well, I don't have a whole lot of about school, but you know, I have a little different subject. So said we, they were rascals in school too. Oh, go ahead. And one story that an old neighbor would all would tell. I don't, I don't know what part he played in. The teacher wanted to. It was getting towards spring, and the teacher, the kids would not carry in some wood for her, for the teacher. And well, she got pretty mad, and then they started carrying in wood, and they wouldn't stop till they had the woodshed empty, and it was all in the schoolhouse. Oh. <laughs> Until, uh, and she couldn't control it. They were, like she mentioned earlier, big kids. And I suppose they got started. Until a school board member saw something going on, and then <laughs> he got them to carry it all back up and stack it up. I heard that story several times. And uh, she talked about the water. Well, in the fall, we, we tried to pump that whole well out, but we'd carry water from a neighbor with a pail, riding a bicycle down the, down the road. Done that for the drink of water. And, and uh, I said, kid and they were shingling the schoolhouse. And I'd been over there on Saturday with my dad playing wood shingles. Come Monday morning, come to school, and of course it was frosty in the fall. And the other kids were there ahead of me, and they said, can you crawl up that scaffold? Oh yeah, I'd been up there on Saturday. Well, I got caught, and I got an hour after school. <laughs> until I found out that those kids all had an hour after school. And she let me off at half hour. Ah, oh, it's just some of the things that happened. I don't know. Stuff like that. And I think it was uh, Armistice Storm. Uh, my dad and Tony Wenzel, and Wenzel name is real common here, was his dad. Uh, they come to school and start, uh, took us kids home with the horses and we got out of school. So none of the kids were stranded that day. Tony did thought it was another snowstorm. But. So, I don't know, that's all I got to say. Oh, we, we were supposed to learn the midnight ride of Paul Revere for the teacher and know it on Friday and we didn't know it so we studied hard, two of us studied hard over the weekend and we knew it and she never asked for it. Oh. <laughs> oh. And then we had a, a school district, a school reunion and Kenny Wenzel, he's a brother to Steve Wenzel, yep. mm -hmm. he, uh, him and I, we knew it and we recited it for her. The Good teacher was it. there so Might we did well. recite it, that's Say, all. Dad, that was uh, Linnea Sledham. We had her for six years old. You used to have to recite poems in the country school, in your country school. A lot of poems, and you know a few good ones yet. Do you think you could pick one? <laughs> no, we, well, we learned uh, Paul Revere's ride to a certain point, but we did know that. What about the thistles? Oh, oh. <laughs> I better not go in. That was Charlie Martin in high school. Oh, that's Charlie Martin. How about, was there one about a duck? No, I don't remember that. Oh, but that okay. was the off I'm system. losing up. Does somebody else know a poem that they can still recite? Mm -hmm. You want to hear that? 
Yes. yes. I think we need to hear it. Theophilus Thistle, the successful thistle sifter, in sifting a sieve full of unsifted thistles, thrice thrust 3,000 thistles through the thick of his thumb. Now see that now in sifting a sieve full of unsifted thistles, thrice not 3,000 thistles through the thick of thy thumb. Success to the successful thistle sifter. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about the uh, one-room schoolhouse, that's the only education I had. Uh, I went to District 79. It was between Swanville and Uppsala. And, um, well, I, I didn't like school anyway. So, and I couldn't go to high school because, uh, well, World War II broke out and my brothers were drafted. And my dad lost his right hand. His, was, his health wasn't too good at the time. So I had to stay home and farmed. And uh, I was running a farm when I was 16 years old. I probably didn't do a good job, but we survived. <laughs> and uh, like I tell people, you know, I didn't go to high school. I didn't go to college. But I did the next best thing. I married a school teacher. <laughs> uh, and I could tell some of the stories about the games we played. Uh, my hearing is so bad, maybe some of you guys talked about it, but I didn't understand it. But one game we played was uh, Ante Over the Schoolhouse. Anybody play that? Yeah. Oh, a lot of them. <laughs> and our school had um, a bell tower. Once in a while, the ball had fallen in the bell tower. <laughs> we were in trouble then. So we had to... Um, get two ladders, one to reach the roof and lay one under. One of the brave kids would crawl up there and get the ball. And, um, well, uh, I could think of a few more stories. We had a lot of fun. We played kitten ball. Uh, toward the end, we even played basketball a little bit, just on the gravel car behind the building. Um, and... Um, uh, the, the school ground was two acres, and right on the end of the school, uh, I'm going to tell the story because Diane liked it. <laughs> right on the end of the school ground was a gravel pit. And we, had, we weren't supposed to go in there, but we had so much fun the teacher didn't mind. We'd go in there and we'd build roads with uh, big sticks. And then uh, this is during prohibition days now, see? <laughs> So we'd build roads, and then we'd run around these roads, and we'd holler, booze cellar, booze cellar. <laughs> and then uh, some of the kids were FBI men. They'd run after us. If they could catch us, they'd put us in the jail. And the jail was four trees. And we'd have to stand between those four trees. Well, anybody remember gangbusters on the radio? Uh, there's one convict that uh, invented dynamite out of salt and pepper. So we brought some salt and pepper with the school. Boom, we broke out of jail. <laughs> well, uh, then there's another story I, I'll never forget. Um, uh, I think it was during Valentine's Day, and uh, we had a program, and our folks came uh, to the program. We had a little program, and then the teacher says, well, you kids can go out and play. When you come back, we're going to have lunch. Well, uh, off the other side of the school ground was um, a big woods and a real steep hill. We weren't supposed to go there, but, you know, we had so much fun, they let us go. And we'd uh, ski down the hill, and we'd had toboggans. Well, not many toboggans. We were poor, you know. Um, 
But anyway, some farmer left a Model T fender out there, and that was the best sled to slide off. <laughs> well, when we'd leave school, um, we'd all run and try and get that fender to slide on. You know, the first guy had it. Well, this one particular day, and I had a brand new pair of corduroy pants on. Probably the only pants I ever got in my life when I went to, we were poor, you know. Depression days, you know. Uh, anyway, I, I got the first and I got the fender. So I grabbed the fender and I take a run on top of the hill and I flopped down the fender and down the hill I went. Well, I hit some bumps and all of a sudden I whirled around, fell off the fender. When I got up, I felt a draft on the back of my pants. <laughs> Brand new corduroy pants. Oh, my gracious, what'll I do? <laughs> so I couldn't go back to school for lunch. I told one of the kids, I said, you go over there and get my lunch meal. I'm going to walk home. <laughs> and that's what I did. Well, anyway, um, uh, back in those days, uh, we didn't have good roads. We had to walk. I think it was a good two miles against the wind, northwest wind, and it was cold. We'd walk at five buckled over shoes. If we walked the road, it was uh, further, so we'd try and go across with skis. And uh, I, I walked with uh, the first friend I ever had. He was two years older than I am. And that kid had every bad habit you could think of. <laughs> He'd have bull Durham, you know, in his shirt pocket. He'd roll cigarettes, and come on, you got to roll one. So I had to be big, you know, I'd roll a cigarette. And we'd smoke a little on the way to school, you know. And he had always had a can of Copenhagen in the back pocket. <laughs> Give me a pinch. It tasted terrible. Uh, but I had to be big, I chewed. But once in a while, he had a uh, beech nut. And that was kind of sweet and that tasted pretty good. But you know, I never got the habit, thank God. <laughs> I don't smoke or drink, no. Uh, let's see, I thought I had another story, but um, what was it? Uh, uh, maybe I'm talked out. <laughs> so, okay, that's about it. My name is Audrey Majeris, and um, the reason I'm here is to tell you about a schoolhouse that we refurbished in our yard. And this is the school that Pat Tedford went to. Now, as she explained, it was between 49 and 48. Uh, this is kind of close to the Crowing Counter, to the border there, coming into Crowing County. No? Well, Freedom. Close enough. Anyway... <laughs> Fort Ripley. Township. Ripley Township. Thank you. Yes. Well, anyway, um, in the 1950s, when that school consolidated, my parents, who lived in 49, decided that their house was just a small farmhouse. They needed extra room. So they decided they would purchase that schoolhouse, which was located about six miles away from our house. And I was quite young, but I do recall when they made the purchase agreement, there was about a couple of days later, and um, already there was vandalism to the school. Somebody shot a, you know, this. there was a gunshot, and so it went through a window, it was a broken window, and some of the, the furnishings that were in there were taken. But they did... We did move it, and as I remember, it was moved in uh, two flatbeds. I believe the part that you had explained, or that was explained, which was the woodshed, that didn't go with. But um, so, and they, I remember as being small, that they had the power company had to pull the electric lines up high so that they could get it through. So it came in the yard, and my parents, fortunately, had a nice cement foundation. And we put it on there, and they used it for storage. We had house storage. We had storage from the 
whatever they needed. Sometimes there was feed in there, I do recall. And we used it as a playhouse, so it was a play area too. I had all sisters. And then the part that was the library and the coat room, they made into a milk house. So it was very functional for them. Um, they were busy, and they did keep up the roof, though, so, which was fortunate. And they lived there for over 60 years. And then in, like, 2003, my husband and I purchased the farm. And um, the, many of the buildings were really quite dilapidated and, or needed a lot of tender, loving care. So we started with the house and just started working through all the different buildings. And at first, we were starting to get rid of some things. Now, there was some old farm machinery. Many of it, much of it didn't really work, or there were parts and pieces all over. So we kind of put some things together. And then we decided, wow, we really are blessed to have all this. Why don't we share it with others? So that maybe was good, maybe it wasn't. But, um, and we had a lot of the farm things from being a dairy farm and, and everything else. So we did refurbish, and um, I'm just going to show you, I, I do have a fair amount of stuff. We lived on that place until 2014, and over the years, we did, this is what the schoolhouse got to look like. Plus, all of the buildings, basically, um, we, we redone. And here's another pictures with the schoolhouse. And I'll have this available for you. If I would have brought all my stuff, I have quite a bit. We had tours come in, and we had um, school. Many school children came through. One time we had like 70 at a time. They would come with buses. We had uh, family reunions were there, um, Sunday school, church groups, basically all ages, and then a lot of the elderly, and it was free. My husband was in charge of the outside, basically, so he would go through all this farm machinery and explain what was 100 years ago, how did they farm, and the whole basic thing was to preserve history and that they would get to know what was taking place. And I basically had the school part. I'm not a school teacher. We had part of it, a little bit of a museum. Um, we did make it in the paper. Also, we had this little, this was, it was called the Majerus History Center. So we would give this little trifold out, and in it, we would have the variety of um, the schoolhouse, some of the other areas, the museum, an old trash machine, some of the old, old uh, types of, of, um, of farm machinery, which was always so interesting, and my husband felt it was interesting because we get some people would come there, they would know exactly what type it was and how they had worked on it. And um, many of the, the students, we did have a time where the attendees came to the school, and it was amazing because they would come in and they said, it looks so big before, and now it just seems so small. And of course, as you're small, everything looks big. <laughs> so um, we did get our pictures in the paper. This was the one time that we had the Randall School come. This was one of our first times, actually. We had about 70 students come in that time. And, uh, so it, and they were so well prepared. My husband and I uh, dressed like Little House on the Prairie. My husband usually wore overhauls, and I wore the, all the clothes that would be going with that. And then we did make the Brainerd paper. And uh, they did it a little bit. We called it um, History Center Museum. It was all free, so it was just, uh, it was kind of a fun thing, really. And uh, here's one of the pictures. That's how I was dressed. And sometimes I used to like to tell because um, Pat was so helpful, Pat Tedford, and in, since she went to that school. And so we would get some of these city kids. Some kids were familiar with, especially reading Little House on the Prairie series, how country life was. But one of them that I really enjoyed telling um, was when, um, I believe you were, Pat was in about first grade, 
at the time. And it was a cold, wintry day, you know, like we get in Minnesota. And the parents made sure their children were brought to school because the weather was very inclement. Well, they got to school and the parents let the kids off. Uh, and they did not know the teacher didn't make it. The teacher lived in Little Falls. Of course, there's no telephones. There's no way of knowing. And um, I believe one of the Brill girls in eighth grade or someone. We didn't have Brills, but the boys somehow well, got to school. Right. Got the big stove going. And Betty Poisson was, was an eighth grader. Yeah. She sat like that there. Mm -hmm. And she taught us all school that day. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Our parents came to get us at night. We were so proud. We were there all day, all by themselves. All by themselves. Isn't that amazing? And, and then we would ask the question, I'd ask, well, what, what would happen now? You know, if the teachers weren't there and the staff weren't there? And the kids themselves will say, it would be very chaotic. You wouldn't want to come back to the school. But how amazing is because they were told the respect, it, they, they, they conducted the classes, and also the boys with the wood stove, um, you know, they just followed the orders from this eighth grade student. So um, that is, um, we, we did this for, well, 14 years, basically. So we had many people come through. Uh, we had many, even family reunions that would come through. And uh, then we moved. Uh, so the, f the schoolhouse is still there, and uh, as we did with renovation too, there, there did take, we got um, some of the old type of wood, the slats, and uh, had the windows, because we redid the house, and the house was old, so we were able to use the same windows. They all fit very well, because it was all about the same era. This was uh, 1902, this was built. It's District 108, and um, so we, in that the floor was in good shape. I was always so grateful for my parents that they kept the roof up and had a cement foundation. And so some of the, some of the walls needed a little, little touch, but mostly from the outside, so it wasn't the inside. So it really worked out well. And um, then when we moved, most of the farm machinery, which we had quite a bit, we did give to the Amish, um, did try to give it away to people so that uh, we wanted to preserve it. I mean, some of this didn't work either very well. And the schoolhouse things and also some of the farm things that were due to their, um, I mean, they, they farmed there, some of the horse things we gave to family members. And then fortunately or unfortunately, we brought it all to our house <laughs> where we moved to. So I have in the basement, I basically have like three rooms just dedicated to that stuff. And one is a schoolhouse room. And that's the kids enjoy that and play there. So I do have some of the books here. Um, there is the other thing that I thought was so informative, too, was I do have the rules for the teachers from the old days. So I don't know if you want me to say any of them. I can, or are you too busy? Or, so, or if it's something you don't want, it's okay, too. Oh, I have the 1872 or the 1915. Maybe I'll try the 1915 because that's closer to our era. You will not marry during the term of your contact. You are not to keep company with men. Of course, these were all women, I'm sure. You must be home between the hours of 8 and 6 a.m., 6 p 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. unless attending a school function. You may not loiter downtown in ice cream stores. You may not travel beyond the city limits unless you have the permission of the chairman of the board. You may not ride in a carriage or an automobile with any man unless he is your father or brother. You may not smoke cigarettes. Now, you kids got caught with it. You, might, you may not dress in bright colors. You may, under no circumstances, dye your hair. You must wear at least two petticoats. To keep the school room neat and clean, you must sweep the floor at least once daily, scrub the floor at least once a week with hot, soapy water, clean the blackboards at least once a day, and start the fire at 7 a.m. so the room will be warm by 8. And if you were the older ones in 1872, each day you had to fill the lamps and clean the chimneys also. But um, so, 
Thank you. If there's any questions, you can look at these. So, I don't know if you want. <laughs> well, good question. Well, the other one were there say, any men teachers? Did you have any male teachers? You had two of them. When, I, I, when we had uh, different families coming or different people come into our school, I always it was so interesting to find about um, how their school experience was. And I just, most of them had a good school experience, you know, with the teachers, and, and they, they did some naughty things, some of them, but it was nothing compared to what was really naughty nowadays. However, there were some, especially uh, the, some of the older people that came, there were some that said the teachers, especially the male teachers, they really had some struggles with. They, they said they were, they were not nice to them. And they would take them behind and really, you know, give them more than a spanking, they said. So anyway, I mean, it was kind of a both way. And we found that... Um, we really wanted to preserve history, so we really want young people to get excited, but not all young people are for the old, the antique stuff either. But it seems like there's getting to be more and more of the young ones that are now, though, and um, especially some who would get acquainted with Little House on the Prairie or depending upon their teachers and get involved in some of these, you know, the old type of style of living. So, and we wouldn't very much mention that how important school was, community, family, God, in those, and how people would stick together and work together. And especially with the farm machinery, we had a lot of fun because we say, now the thrashing crew, who, how many would you need? And we would try to get the kids a little bit involved in what areas they would want to help with. So it was, uh, it was a fun thing. My husband couldn't be here, but otherwise he probably would do a lot more talking than me. <laughs> So, okay, if there's any questions, yes. What are they doing with the school now? Uh, the, the people that purchased the school, um, they like the building, but I, apparently I think it's a storage more. So it's still, it's still there. We're just, you know, want them to keep it up because it is, it is some work keeping it up and, uh, but uh, to maintain it. So I think so, but um, I don't think they... You know, they weren't interested in keeping or having any of this there at the time. In fact, our realtor, when we were ready to sell, and we'd ask the realtors, and they more or less thought of it as um, not as valuable as we thought. We just put a little more value because we thought it's preserving history, where they, they said it was a tool shed. And, uh, you know, so it was uh, less insurance and, you know, was not valued as much, so... But it's still there, and uh, it's fun to go past it. And we do have the, you know, written out in the front that it's a District 108 and uh, 1902 built. So, uh, yes, it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed it. It was, uh, you know, how it is in here, too. It's just such a peaceful place to go in one of these old schoolhouses. So, okay. Somebody out there just dying to say something, and I wanted to make a comment. I came across in, in, in my mother-in-law's uh, bookcase. There was a little book, and here my grandfather had written a paragraph about district the same school Andy went, and it was about getting water. This was about in the teens. Getting water, they go down the hill, it's his turn to get water, and there in the water is where the frogs are, and you shoo them away, and you push the dead ones out of the way, and you scoop up your drinking water, and you take that back, and that's what the school children drink. And there were a number of people who commented on the water and the frogs, but I found there was about four comments about kind of wondering how they could do that, drink all that frog infested water. But there was one little girl who had written in her, as a woman, she reflected that the best thing about that schoolhouse was the good tasting drinking water. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a comment or just, I know there's a lot of comments out there. People want to say something. Go ahead. Hi everyone. I'm Kathy Broad. My maiden name was Gilman. I'm the oldest of 12. And I went to a country school that we moved to when I was probably 
about six. And so that would have been uh, something about this size, but double. So there we had the basement part and an upstairs part. And June Brucher was a teacher on the top part. And uh, Mrs. Hyatt, Alice Hyatt was the teacher uh, at the time that I went for sixth grade. Uh, I especially enjoyed her. And what was special about her is she could play the accordion and she knew how to play the piano. So, you know, when you're, when you're a little family, you don't do that kind of stuff. And so here's, a, you had a choir, you, you had Christmas concerts, um, so many things of that sort. And then the families came together, there would be picnics. There was reasons to go outside, and, and like you were talking about the different games, there was pump, pump, pull away, there was uh, softball and stuff like that. And when the ball hit me right here, I never played again. <laughs> um, but um, there was like the Christmas programs where we would have a wire and then pull something shut. And uh, one of the young men beside me, um, David Ringwelski, so, he was a year younger than me, and she taught us how to sing a song I'd never heard of before. Um, at some point, it was, oh, gosh darn. I'll, I'll maybe remember that. Hmm? How great, how great thou art. Okay, uh, my background didn't necessarily have that, but the beautiful music that could do this. And it was just the greatest thing ever. Well, then, Alice lived at my grandparents' house. That was where she boarded. And her husband lived up by Fort Ripley, and the snows would come, and it would, you know, put them in. So if she needed to be close to the school, and they stayed friends with us and our families, and became like an aunt and uncle type of thing for years. So those are some of the experiences that just stay with you. Thank you. This, this is a country school that I went to. Um, as you can see, I'm a rather large person, and when I was a fifth grader, I was so big, I got that desk without the seat on it, that folding chair, that I, I come in here and I'm looking, huh, that's just like it was when I was here in country school. Yeah. To the mic. Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. But, <laughs> um, Gilman, I'm, I'm sorry, you forgot the auto harp. Remember the auto harp? Mrs. Hyatt used that all the time. Oh, okay. That was one other thing that she played <laughs> but now I'm sitting there, I'm pulling a blank on what, oh, as the country school is closed, town, they, they were coming out, the Little Falls School District was coming out and picking up books and, you know, any extra materials that we had in school to take back into town. And I can still remember, you know, things you don't forget. Um, here comes this person with all these boxes and he comes in the school and it wasn't very long after that. <laughs> The boxes come flying out. This guy comes flying out of there. I don't, I'm not 100% sure, but she may have booted him in the behind to get him out of there, and she told him, you come back when school is done. <laughs> Country school wasn't done yet. You come back when school is done. So that was the, the good old days because we were all younger when they happened. So. Was that not when they were coming to take the things that the city schools wanted from right, the exactly. schools? Right, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. And they were in. Yep, I, I, like I said, though, that was, you know, it was spring of the year, school was just about done, but it was not done, and she made sure he knew it wasn't done yet, so, but, oh, another, another one other story here, <laughs> I guess we learned about detente in, uh, in country school, but there was one year, the school, the school was surrounded by oak trees, white oaks, red oaks, I think it was mostly white oaks, so that's unimportant, but there was all these acorns. And so this big battle brewed, and you had teams, and everybody had their leaf forts and, and acorns, and, and uh, Mrs. Hyatt had to put her, put her foot down when somebody started bringing acorns from home, because that, sh <laughs> <laughs> that, that shifted the balance of power. <laughs> so we knew what detente was, I guess. So <laughs> that, oh, I could go on, but those are some of the more fun stories, so.
after the <coughs> excuse me after the pledge of allegiance in the in the morning what songs did you sing in school that was music time well maybe america of the beautiful how about way down upon the swanee river how about old black joe how many other ones of stephen fosters we can't have anymore because they're not politically correct, which I find just very, very annoying, personally. How many of you remember where Siam was? Orange Free State. Oh, come on. <laughs> Siam was Thailand. Yeah. It's Thailand. Yeah. The Free States, the Orange Free States, that was part of Af South Africa. It's part, part of South Africa. That's the globes and the maps that we learn from. Just what about? Oh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, I got that wrote down. Pledge of Allegiance, I believe, was written in 1877, modified in 1898. Congress authorized its usage in 1942, and then it was modified in '54 with the additions of the word "under God." But there was a. Uh, article in the last newsletter from the uh, Historical Society about the Pledge of Allegiance and students not reciting the Pledge of Allegiance in school and the results. There were consequences. So, and this fly up here is very annoying, so I'm leaving. <laughs> My dad has passed away a couple years ago, and so, my dear dad, I can tell this story now. It wasn't all that many years ago. My dad, we were talking about country school, and dad was passing out some of his country school things and dividing it amongst us kids. And he said, you know, I spent three years in the eighth grade. I said, dad, three years in the eighth grade? How did you do that? Yeah. Well, he said, we had this teacher. And Dorothy talks about how, how, you know, hard it was for some of them. Well, this teacher, she couldn't control all the kids. This was at District 42, right on County Road 48. And there was quite a few kids in that school. So he said, first year, she was my teacher in eighth grade, I didn't learn a thing. Because us boys, we could never pass our exam at the end of the year. The second year came, and he said, in the middle of the school year, Stella LaBlaw became our teacher. Wow. And oh boy, he said, I learned the second half of the year, but I didn't learn enough to pass my exam. But the third year, I passed it well. <laughs> and see if I can keep a straight face. Um, I started school, first grade, in District 33. June Brutzer was my first grade teacher. So there were 10 of us. There wasn't enough room for everybody to sit. So one girl had to sit at her desk. And then the school board, after, I don't know, a month or two, bought three brand new desks. Well, then it was, who was going to sit at the desk? We all wanted to sit at the new desks. Because they weren't like these desks. They were individual desks that the top lifted up and you had a seat. And Well, it ended up with some of the older kids got to sit in them. But anyway, when I started first grade, I didn't know my numbers. I didn't know my letters. You know, I didn't know the ABCs. Um, so my mother helped me a little bit. Um, and I remember she always, I would skip. I'd go from 12 to 14. Well, 13's going to cry if you forget it. Okay, so that stuck in my mind. So anyway, we were supposed to be learning the numbers, and Mrs. Brucher asked us, told us, not asked us, told us to go up to the blackboard and write our numbers. We were supposed to write from 1 to 20. So okay, we were busy writing on, and <laughs> this one girl, Yvonne Newman, started writing. We had pretty much stopped because we had gotten to 20. She was going on and on and on. 
we had sat down. She was still going. She went all the way up to 100. <laughs> and I looked at that, and I thought, huh, it just repeats. <laughs> you change the next the number in front, and it goes on. So you go 20, 30. Oh, simple. Never thought of it. I don't know how Yvonne come up with it, if her mother <laughs> come up with it or not. But anyway. Um, Gerald Harris. What, what year were you in first grade? Uh, 1955. So, um, there were, like I said, there was 10 of us first graders. We had a program. One of the things was we were supposed to be the 10 little Indians. Okay. Um, and then was we were supposed to sing and do the hokey pokey. That just scared the living daylights out of me, so that night I was sick. <laughs> and when, when my folks came home, because my folks, uh, my ma went, and she came home and she says, Mr. Feeks was upset. He had gone to see me do the hokey pokey. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in trouble. But anyway, talk about walking. Um, I was... I guess you would say fortunate. Uh, the next door neighbor took his milk to York's dairy, and so he would pick me up and take me and his son Wayne to school. Well, in nice days, he would drop us off at the railroad crossing. We lived on Highway 10, and he would take us as far as the railroad crossing, and then we had to go a half mile east and then a half mile up to the schoolhouse. Well, anyway, so sometimes we just walk across the meadow to cut the corner. And, uh, you know, if the dew was on the grass, we had wet shoes. If the frost was on the grass, we had wet shoes. Well, then there was one day Wayne and I got sidetracked. Um, at the railroad, was between the railroad and uh, Highway 10 was this ditch. We were throwing railroad rocks into the ditch. Well, all of a sudden, Wayne said, here come the cops. So he threw his rock. I went to throw my rock. Well, trouble is, I lost my balance. I went into the water. I didn't want to go to school. I knew I was in trouble. Anyway, Wayne went ahead. I come dragging along. School hadn't started yet. But anyway, Mrs. Brewster, well, this was really a modern school because we had indoor water, we had indoor toilet, and we had a telephone. So Mrs. Butcher called my mother, and my mother did have a way of getting there, but I, she wasn't very happy. She brought me a different pair of pants, but I had to wear the shoes because that was the only shoes I had. And uh, she didn't give me a paddling, but she wasn't happy with me. Anyway, so... That's pretty much all I got. Oh, one other thing. We're talking about the stove. In uh, the second year, I don't know if what was the reason, but anyway, Mrs. Butcher didn't teach me for second grade. I had another teacher, Cora Hofstede. And uh, one of the things that we had always done the year before was the heat register was about so by so, and we'd stuff our mittens or wet mittens in there to dry. Well, Mrs. Hofstede, no, you can't do that. It makes the room stinky. Just lay them on the shelf by your dinner pail. Well, of course, they didn't dry. So the next time we wanted to wear them, either for the next recess or for going home, they were cold and wet. That didn't go over well. Well, she finally gave in, and uh, we went back to stuffing in the heat register. So, anyway, that's pretty much all. I want to ask Tom Brucher to come back. He has an interesting piece of history. It's a little bit off subject, but it's still worthy, and I think you'd like to hear it. Come on. Just tell him. 
this this summer, what was it, the 90th uh, uh, anniversary of Lindbergh's landing? I think it was 90th. Well, I always felt kind of bad. Dad's, or my grandpa's farm, after Lindbergh had flown across the ocean, he came back and he actually flew the plane from celebration to celebration. And when he came to Little Falls, they didn't have, there was no airport in Little Falls. So, I, like I said, I dad, step in if I miss correct. But anyway, so the, the city fathers or the father, whatever, the people from Little Falls came out and asked if they could use my grandpa's cow yard as a landing strip for Lindbergh's entourage. And so Lindbergh landed on my grandfather's place. It's uh, base. well, unfortunately, it's in the, uh, where the, there's that hole in the ground, just uh, be south and, and west of uh, Cabin Fever. See, Dad, Dad's home place was right, right where the uh, Bell Prairie Junction, yep. right about there was where, the, where his home place was. But he was only a year old. I don't, he didn't remember much, but he sure heard enough from his brothers and sisters. There was a lot of other planes came with him. Right. He was home. My sisters, they got a ride in the other planes because they could use the, the, the field to the land their airplanes in. But uh, tell them about the chalk line. Well, that well, that's not a problem. I feel like around chalk up because everything they put around the chalk around, they would uh, be able to say no with to keep people just kind of a boundary, tell people don't go any farther than that. Well, uh, Dad said, what, what was the last year you farmed that in the 50s? And he was still plowing that chalk line up because that was from, from where they kind of delineate you weren't supposed. I think you, you said, uh, Jake, your older brother, he snuck in and sat in there? Well, everybody went to big salary. So my brother, Jake, claims he snuck in and sat in the spirit. I know that. He was about 14 years, 15 years old. A little bit of family history. My dad, my dad was there when Lindbergh landed. Uh, my dad talked about that always. Wow. He said I was ten feet away from Charles Lindbergh. Wow. He said to, his, I, to his dying day, he, he could tell you the numbers on that plane. So when we went to the Smithsonian years ago, I took lots of pictures of Lindbergh's plane, and I brought them and showed them all to Dad. Cool. Do you have a comment? He, he also used to land on the other side of Lindbergh Park, where Lindbergh Park is now. Yeah. And that was my father-in-law's, uh, my, yeah, my father-in-law's dad's place. But was that uh, um, after he'd flown across or before? That was after. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was uh, Simon Walensky's land. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. After that, every month we got a nice soft blotter with the month on it, and said we should tar our tar our runaways. <laughs> Copper Coke Company would send them a blink ink blotter, you know, with the old fountain pens. You have to run over the ink blotter over. Dad says up until World War II they'd get one every month, and they wanted them to re they wanted them to resurface the Little Falls Airport with Copper Coke's tarmac. Well, lunch buckets and cold, wet clothes and games. Has anybody got some more comments? If no one does, I think we're going to uh, close. So this is kind of like a last call. And of course, conversation can certainly continue. Um, we have a birthday cake up here. I'd like everybody to do. Did they ever sing happy birthday in old country schools? Yeah. Some say yes, and some say, okay, everybody. Dick, you got to stand up. We're going to sing happy birthday in this one-room schoolhouse. You got to stand up. Okay, somebody you can sing better than me, start. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.